he says, Be still, and I know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Psalms 46, 10-11 Have you ever heard about Alexander? Now you're wondering in your mind, which Alexander is he going to talk about? Well, this Alexander happens to only be seven or eight years old. And he is having a terrible, no good, very bad day. And this is how the story goes. When he woke up in the morning, he discovered that he had gone to bed with gum in his mouth, and now it was all in his hair. When he got out of bed, he tripped on his skateboard on the way to the bathroom, and then he dropped his sweater in the sink and got it all wet when he was getting dressed. And he said, I just knew it was going to be a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. Then he went to school, and he had a horrible day there. He didn't get his paper turned in on time. He spilled his juice out of his lunchbox, and at recess he struck out three times. Then came supper. Oh, but before supper, after school, he went to the dentist. Oh, that was bad. Then came supper, and he said, we had cauliflower for supper, and I hate cauliflower. And then on TV, all there was was hugging and kissing, and I don't like hugging and kissing. Then my bath water was too hot, and I got soap in my eyes, and I lost my favorite marble down the drain. And then I went to bed, and Nick, my brother, he took the pillow that he said I could have. And my Mickey Mouse light burned out, and I bit my tongue, and the cat decided to sleep with Nick instead of with me. All in all, he said, it's a horrible, terrible, no good, very bad day. Now, is it any wonder that when Alexander finally came to the end of the day, he heaved a sigh and cried? Gina, do you know how he cried? I think I'll run away to Australia. Have you ever felt that way? I'm sure you had. You might have got a flat tire on the way to work and you were late. And then your inbox had more emails in it than in the evening when you went home than it did at the start of the day. You bounced three checks in your bank account this week. And then the washer quit at home. And the babysitter got COVID. And your mother-in-law just showed up for a month-long stay unannounced. Almost all of us have had days of anxiety and stress and frayed nerves, and we need to learn how to deal with them. As we read the scriptures, we find no instant formula for spiritual maturity. A lot of people are searching for one. They just want to have experience and say a prayer and have instant spiritual maturity. But it doesn't come that way. Growth comes through stress and strain and struggles as we endeavor to live the Christian life. A few years ago, Thomas Hobbes of the University of Washington and some fellow sociologists published their research on human stress. They listed many of the common experiences of life, evaluated their impact on our mental and emotional well-being, and rated them according to stress they produced in our lives. 
This stress rating was expressed in what they called life change units, or LCUs. The worse the stress rating, the higher the LCUs. For instance, getting a divorce, 73 LCUs. Being pregnant, 40 LCUs. Remodeling a home is 25 LCUs. The stress of Christmas is rated at 13 LCUs. On and on went their lists of life stresses, each one related in LCUs. When we learn of a friend, maybe our own age, who is dying of cancer, or when we go to a doctor and he tells us there's something questionable on your x-rays, or when our children grow up and move away, or we sell our home, or we move somewhere else, or we change jobs, or we retire. These all have LCUs. We are constantly being bombarded by LCUs and their conclusion was that if within a year's time we experience a cumulative total of more than 300 life change units, most people will not be able to cope. They conclude that if we experience that many LCUs in one year's time, that most of us will either have a physical or a mental or an emotional breakdown because humanly speaking, we can't cope with that much change. But notice that I said humanly speaking. And I emphasize the word humanly because our trust in God can make all the difference. Now with that in mind, we turn to our scripture this morning. And if you'd open your Bibles to Psalms 46, we're going to be looking at that short chapter. There's only 11 verses. This psalm evidently was written in that kind of environment under stress. There must have been times when the psalmist felt like he was in a pressure cooker and couldn't get out. So he wrote the words of this psalm as he sought to deal with the stresses of life. Listen to that first verse. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The Hebrew word trouble that he used means pressed in. You'd remember that old saying between a rock and a hard spot? Well, this is the kind of pressure that the psalmist is talking about. When you are between a rock and a hard spot, then turn to this psalm, because it ministers in a most amazing and significant way. When Martin Luther was surrounded by enemies, he read this psalm and then wrote the great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He saw the tremendous power of God as a bulwark never failing. Regardless of what happens in the world, there is still the strength and power and might of God. Let me give you a brief overview of this psalm, and then we'll look at it in a little more detail. There are three sections to Psalms 46. Verses 1 through 3 deal with changes in nature. The psalmist says, I will not fear. God is my refuge and my strength. Even though the world around me may be shaking, I will not fear. Then section 2, verses 4 through 7, speaks of changes taking place in society. The psalmist says, I will not be moved, even though nations are falling apart, and even though society is deteriorating, because God is my refuge and strength. I will not be moved. Finally, in the last few verses, 8 through 11, it's almost as if the psalmist sits back after everything he has seen in society and nature and says, I will not let stress ruin my life anymore. I'm going to relax, transform my life, change gears, and get on with it in keeping with God's will. So let's look at verses 1 through 3 and read, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. 
Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give away, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, and the mountains quake with their surgings. It all, almost sounds like the psalmist is familiar with the headlines of our modern day scientific journals, doesn't it? Worrisome things are happening in our world. During the last 20 years, earthquakes have increased at a phenomenal rate. Geologists continue to point at the San Andreas Fault and predict that one day a large chunk of Western California will just fall off into the Pacific Ocean. They say that the Pacific Rim volcanoes are ripe for major eruptions. And what about climate change and typhoons and tsunamis and hurricanes that lash our coasts, the tornadoes that sweep across our states, the blizzards that paralyze our cities, the drought that shrivels up and cracks our farmland, and the floods that wash away bridges and homes? Some are beginning to cry out what is happening to our world today. But as Christians, how are we to react to all of this? The psalmist says, I will not be afraid. My Lord is still in command of the winds and the waves and the sea and all the elements of nature. Therefore, I will not fear. God is my refuge and my strength. Now let's go to verse 4 through 7. There is a river whose streams make glad of God, the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Here he pictures nations in an uproar, kingdoms falling, and great changes taking place. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? There's always the increase in debt limits by our government. There's immigration issues at our southern borders. There's uncontrolled deficit spending, and there's a non-functioning Congress that's supposed to be leading us. For some of us who are a bit older, it's hard to read this passage without thinking about Elvis Presley. I know that shocks you. He started out making $14 a day driving truck. On a fluke, he made a recording that caught the ear of a promoter. Next thing you know, he's one of the highest paid male entertainers in the world. When Elvis Presley died, the airlines were clogged with people trying to get to Memphis. Five tons of flowers were sent to his funeral. People lined the streets just to catch a glimpse of his coffin. Elvis Presley once said, I would give a million dollars for a week of peace. He recorded a song that probably describes his life and maybe ours. All shook up. I'm all shook up. I won't sing and dance that one for you. So is our world. Nations are in an uproar. Mankind seems to be falling apart. Every day it seems like it can't get worse, but it does. But we as Christians don't have to be. We can stand steadfast because God is our refuge and our strength. And because Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. As Christians, we stand strong in the faith and commitment that we have in Jesus, who is our Lord. Then it seems that the psalmist sits back and looks at all the changes that have taken place and he reflects on, him, on them and these are his words, verses 8 and 9. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolation he brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. 
He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Then in verse 10 he says, Be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Do you realize what he's saying? He's saying that in the midst of all that I have decided and I have made a conscious choice that I will no longer let my life be filled with stress and anxiety. It's a choice. Why? Because God is my refuge and my strength. I wonder if you have forgotten how to relax. I know Dorothy says I have. How long has it been since you sat down with your family and ate a meal together and then after the meal just talked and visited and had fun? How long has it been since you took off your shoes and walked barefoot and felt the blades of grass beneath your feet minus the chiggers? How long has it been since you took a long walk in the evening to watch the sunset? Or sat in a hot tub of water and read a whole chapter in a book without interruptions? How long has it been since you just leaned back and relaxed and listened to some good, wholesome music? How long has it been? How long has it been since you spent a day and got away from it all? You look at your wrist, wrist watch and you take it off, you turn your phone off, you forget what time it is, and did what you wanted to do, when you wanted to do it, and for as long as you wanted to do it. Someone said that three words can summarize how most of us are spending our lives. Hurrying, worrying, and scurrying. It's time for us to take the psalmist to heart to be still and know that I am God. So we have some scriptures that I think Ben will put up for us now. The first one is in Psalms 55. These are encouragements in a number of different scriptures. The psalmist says, Psalms 55, Cast your burden on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Then let's move to Isaiah, see what he says in chapter 41, verses 10 through 13. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Then in Matthew, in the New Testament, Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Have we got that one? Oh, finishing 10 through 13. I should, yes. Oh, yeah. Behold, all those who are incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing, and those who strive with you shall perish. You shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existing thing. For I, the Lord your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Then we go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it will be opened. And then our last verse of encouragement, 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now let me close out three great truths that we can draw from Psalms chapter 46. Truth number one, God is always near and available to us. God never puts us on hold. We may be on hold on the telephone or on hold at a red light or on hold at the bank as we deposit our money or on hold at a post office line or on hold in a supermarket or at the DMV. But God is always available and anxious to hear us whenever we want to speak to him. Some of our problems may be superficial, but others are deep and God can help us. So talk to him. Second truth, God's power is greater than anything in all of the world. Greater than winds or storms or earthquakes or volcanoes. There is no greater power. God's power is sufficient to win victory over all the enemies that come our way. The psalmist tells us again, God is our refuge our strength in times of trouble. So don't be afraid to ask him for help. Finally, the third point, God's help works even when we can't help ourselves. Have you felt weak lately? Have you felt like there are too many stresses, too many LCUs in your life, and that you're about ready to crash and burn? God's help is available and all you have to do is reach out for it and grab hold in conclusion if you're here this morning without him as your lord and savior please realize that he wants you to come to him accepting his love receiving his forgiveness and becoming a part of his family